Hello, everyone. Would you please take your seats? The program is about to begin. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for being here. Let's get started and hear first from David McCraney, a best-selling author, a top 100 podcaster, and friend to the Internet Archive. David, please take it away. For those of you who don't know me, my name is David McCrady, and I really wish I could be there with you in that gorgeous room amongst those somewhat creepy statues you have there. And that's sort of the wondrous thing about technology, isn't it? It extends what human beings can do. In part, that's what we're going to talk about here tonight. I'm a science journalist, a lecturer, a podcaster. I write books about things. And what I mostly cover and research is what human beings can and can't do. Writers like myself sometimes like to think we're outside of technology because we can do what we do with a pen and a piece of paper, but a pen and a piece of paper are technology. Books are technology. And many of these books were written with a computer, emailed back and forth to an editor, researched with a search engine. And the truth is, this technology has been extending what we can do all the way back to the printing press, way before that. And I don't have to tell you that as soon as you adopt some new piece of technology, a newer piece comes along. Technology changes the world, then the world uses technology to change technology, and then that new technology changes the world some more, and it just keeps... It's a good idea for a podcast episode. I'm going to take a digital note on this. So, yeah. Technology. It's going to change things. Some of it for the worse, a lot of it for the better. And where it changes things for the better, it's going to expand the limited capabilities of human beings. And it's going to extend the reach of those capabilities, both in speed and scope. It's about a newfound freedom of mind and time, and democratizing that freedom so everyone has access to it. Tonight, we're going to look at how technology and the Internet Archive are extending the capacities of research so that we can see more, so that we can understand more, so that we can access more. And tonight's program is about the past, the present, and the future of the Internet Archive, artificial intelligence, and that dream of universal access to all knowledge. So thank you very much for inviting me to do this, and I do really wish that I could be there to enjoy it with you. So... Have fun. Hmm. Thank you so much, David. And again, welcome everyone. For those of you who haven't noticed yet, I am your AI-generated host. Also, if you haven't picked up on why I'm a talking bust, we're doing a sort of antiquity to the age of AI design theme. I also apologize if I appear quite uncanny but I'm guessing that many of you are going to be seeing a lot more AI-generated everything in the coming year. So by the end of this event, hopefully you're a bit more prepared for that. I was made by some wonderful artists and volunteers, and I'm here because I founded what's considered to be the first successful public subscription library in America, which still exists as a research library today. And tonight is precisely about research libraries like the Internet Archive in the age of AI. So let's start at the beginning of it all by hearing first from the Internet Archive founder. Everyone, please welcome our very own digital librarian, Mr. Brewster Kale. Welcome. Thank you. And thank you, uh, AI Ben. Uh, so welcome to the Internet Archive's 2023 annual event. I'm really glad that you're here. OK, so we promised a little old to, old, old to new. I can't quite go back as far as Ben, but I can go back to 1980. I was a student at MIT at the Artificial Intelligence Lab, um, and we were dreaming of building machines. OK, I had hair. It wasn't great hair. Um, uh, there, we were building machines. We wanted to build machines that could think. Danny Hillis said we wanted to build a machine that would be proud of us. That we were, these were heady days. 
Um, we were trying to build these things, though, and we were data starved. Even the supercomputer that I helped build in that time held all of 32 megabytes of memory. The disk pack, which was the size of a bar, was five gigabytes. We were a long way from making the global brain that we were dreaming of. We all knew what was coming, right? We all sort of understood the, the, the graphs and the like, um, but I thought a role that I could play was to try to build the content, if you will, the data sets, collect the material. So I collected, back then, I collected all the phone books of the Boston area just before uh, they were gonna go to the printer. I collected the Boston census that had sort of, you know, how many people were where, but underneath that you could go and deduct what the, how all of the streets linked together. You could make a street map. And reimagining with these databases could be used for that would be something audacious. We wanted to make a direction assistant. We wanted to make it so that you could use your phone to call up a machine and it would answer, hello, this is Thinking Machines Direction Assistance. Can I help you? Tell me where you are and where you want to go and I will tell you how to drive there. Okay, this is state of the art. Okay, so we didn't have cell phones then. We didn't. We barely had modems, and this is uh, what we what we were able to go and then describe how people should go and drive from one place to another in Boston. Okay, truth be told, it didn't work all that well. <clears throat> but the future, uh, where machines augmented with data, interacting with people, was going to help us in new and different ways. What I didn't realize then, but I think is so important, is that you actually have to have the data in your hands to be able to use it and reuse it in new and different ways. Ways that were not imagined by the original publishers of, say, the phone book uh, or the census. That that was going to be key. Once the data was in our library, we could do new things with it. So we started building building and building and building along. So I went off to build the digital library um, to try to create these new, unimagined and fantastical new services that we knew would start to come out. Roll time forward 40 years, and the Internet Archive is maturing. Starting with web pages, uh, we started collecting in 1996. We now have hundreds of billions of pages from hundreds of millions of websites. <laughs> then we started collecting television. Um, and in the year 2000, Russian, Chinese, Japanese, Iraqi, Al Jazeera, BBC, CNN, NBC, 24 hours a day to be able to have a record of television news because we knew it was going to be important. We started collecting in the year 2000, but um, we made a small service in 2001, but it was un not until 2009 that we started to actually build the services on top uh, of that. Hundreds of thousands of pieces of software are now archived, seven million digital digitized books. We digitize it about a million books a year, which is excellent. <laughs> Music, software, all these sorts of things. It's a service that's used by about two million people a day that are, go to the website. There are about five million people that use the Internet Archive every day, and we, they don't even know they're using the Internet Archive. But we're there for them. And the idea that this uh, has turned into uh, the, mo the 200th to 300th most popular website, I think is kind of a testament to not only this group, but also the world that actually wants to see older materials. The Internet Archive, by weaving data and machines and empowering people to pull off some amazing feats. Um, I found that a way of describing the Internet Archive is through Wikipedia. So Wikipedia, everybody knows Wikipedia, it's kind of awesome, uh, one of the marvels of the, of the modern times. But it's written by real people that need libraries, but also there are people reading these that want to go deeper. And so we've been working with Wikipedia um, to go and run over the, uh, the Wikipedia for the last 15 years, collecting any new URL that's referenced by any Wikipedian and archiving it. And we knew it would be important at some, 
at some point. So then about, I don't know, six, seven years ago, we made another robot that went and fixed broken links in Wikipedia. And it turns out that links rot after about 100 days, um, so a lot of them were gone. And as of a couple years ago, we had uh, fixed 11 million broken links. <laughs> Working now um, for the last more, just keep going, keep going. I just heard today we crossed over the 300th Wiki Wikipedia language edition that is now getting fixed, their, their broken links. Um, so we're now at 300 as of today, which is kind of great. And another milestone from today is uh, we just fixed our 19 millionth broken link in Wikipedia. Uh, yes. So what we wanted to do is go further than that as well to go and make it so people could go and get to the books that are referenced in Wikipedia. So we basically crawled Wikipedia again, tried to find all of the, uh, the books that were referenced, acquired those books, digitized those books, and tried to weave those links back into Wikipedia. And as of now, uh, we've uh, got one million links in these uh, Wikipedias, two uh, books, and they open often right to the right page. So the idea of going deeper and not being just sort of this uh, AI Skynet thing that's going to, you know, detach from people, but it's woven in with people has been, I think, the great lesson of the last uh, 40 years uh, from me, and it doesn't seem like it's going to stop. Um, just as people are now depending on online resources for accurate information, libraries are more necessary than ever. Libraries have been coming under attack, however. So, okay, a lot of good news, but right now it's actually being a little bit scary to be a library. And it's not just us. Um, uh, fortunately, people are starting to pay attention to the plight of libraries. And for the first time in several years, they published our words in a real mainstream paper, The Guardian, about what uh, is going on and the forces that are now aligned and attacking libraries. We've probably heard a lot about the book bannings that are going on and meant by many politicians and promoted and actually happening and threatening libraries. But you probably don't know, also know that there's been large numbers of defundings of libraries that are going on in such a way that they're just getting stripped down. So the legislatures are now starting in many places aligning against libraries in many places in the United States. But the thing that I think is underappreciated is what corporations are doing through draconian licensing terms that make it so that libraries don't actually own anything digital at all, that they can only get streaming access to these things. So if you go and borrow an ebook, say from the San Francisco Public Library, you're not actually borrowing their ebook, you're getting passed through to a third party database uh, that's driven by the publishers so they can surveil every page turn. And they can change that book or delete it at any time. This is just not that great, right? So we're having these kinds of, of approaches. And the Internet Archive, um, when it uh, uh, went and digitized its holdings so that it could lend things out, um, we're sued by the, uh, the publishers because it wasn't part of their streaming vision um, to go and have all the 20th century available. They just wanted to have just their greatest hits available through their, uh, their, their service. And the big surprise to me is that the judiciary has now sided with the publishers, not just in our case, but in other cases that have been brought against uh, libraries. So we've got a problem out there. People need libraries more than ever, um, but we have a, a set of forces that are making libraries harder and harder to happen. So we have to do something more about it, and it was really great that people came to our aid. 
that when we um, needed uh, support, people came and protested and helped um, the uh, Internet Archive to be able to find uh, uh, support for us and to go and propagate the message. Just in time for another lawsuit against the Internet Archive. This one was brought by the RIAA with their major uh, uh, record labels against us for going and having the audacity to making 78 RPM records uh, available, which we had been doing for 15 years. And they didn't go and say, oh, you should take these down, and then we refused. They just hit us with a lawsuit. So we basically got this uh, on us, but it's coming at libraries from many different directions. So we need to stand behind libraries more than ever. And I'd like to highlight somebody that's, that's doing an extra uh, amount of that. So we had our protests on the, sh on the uh, steps of, of, of this building um, to go and show that we were uh, in support of libraries. And our uh, San Francisco city supervisor, she said she was sorry that she couldn't come, but she had another thing that she, could, uh, she might be able uh, to do to help. She said that she... Uh, could write a resolution, and maybe, just maybe, the other supervisors would support the idea of supporting libraries, unlike what we're seeing in a lot of the country where they're taking away their fundings and not supporting them. And it happened. The, res the, uh, the resolution was written, and it was passed unanimously. Uh, and for taking this stand, and to give, I would like to give our annual Internet Archive Hero Award of 2023 to Connie Chan, the city supervisor for our district in San Francisco. I would like to welcome, please welcome Connie Chan to the stage. Please say a few words, if you would. Thank you, and uh, good evening. Uh, it's really a privilege to be here celebrating with you, celebrating Internet Archive. Uh, I am a first-generation immigrant. I was born in Hong Kong and uh, grew up in Taiwan. I came here to San Francisco's Chinatown when I was 13 years old. And when I arrived, I didn't really speak any English. Um, so I went to this place called Chinatown Library. And Chinatown Library had Chinese books. It was amazing because they were free. And there were a lot of them. And in a foreign country, being able to read books for free, uh, in my mother tongue, it was amazing and comforting. But at the same time, it took me another step. I also was able to read English books and other books and continue on and on my education throughout time. It's the reason why I know libraries to people like me, first generation immigrants, low income immigrants at that time with my single mother and my brother. I knew that living in Chinatown and having access, free access to information was part of the critical part of my education and to higher education. And I know that I was not alone. And it's true, I think that many of you know that we are not alone because we needed library. Library was probably by far the best system that United States had come up with. <laughs> so when I learned about Internet Archive, I was like, what is this wonderful thing? I don't understand it because it's beyond me. It's not a physical library, but an online library. And I learned more and more about it, and I have a wonderful tour. Uh, thank you to uh, Booster. But here, I'm not an engineer, clearly. Uh, I do not understand internet. Uh, in fact, I do not understand the technology very much of it. But uh, here, what I understand when I learn about Internet Archive, it is a gym. It's a hidden gym that we can see for few things that I thought it's very critical to humanity. First is freedom, diversity, and truth. It's freedom to information. 
is diversity of information, but most importantly, it's the access to truth. And that is what we need. And here we are, I really believe we're not just fighting for libraries and access to free freedom and information, we're really fighting for our humanity. It is for our humanity, humanity to exist. So thank you. This award, I'm grateful, but really this award belonged to Brewster and all the people that have been supporting Internet Ar Archive. And I really hope that you will continue to fight with us and stand with Internet Archive. This fight is worth it. It's worth it. Thank you. Okay, we need more politicians like Honey Chan. Uh, tonight, you're going to hear how we are strong and we're growing to use the tools of AI to create better libraries and better services that benefit us all. This can be uh, the Research Libraries Day, the day we have been building for the day that we've been collecting for, the day where the collective works of humankind can be more relevant to more people's lives. I thank you very much for coming. The rest of the show, um, you'll see some videos, but you'll also see some of the real uh, work that's going on using the Internet Archive's research collections to go and do new and different things and also help build the collections. Thank you very much. web archiving every day to save evidence for investigation. We believe this is crucial for journalism. The Internet Archive is indispensable in creating our podcast. A lot of old websites where you can't find them anywhere, you can find them on the Wayback Machine. Internet Archive is my favorite way to teach history, showing real live footage of actual events that happened, having them listen to sound bites. Thank you, Internet Archive, for contributing to and enabling my creative practice as an artist, as a video game developer, as a musician, and all the other ways you've enriched the world. But giving me free access to a huge collection of books from the past, the Internet Archive allows me to discover new fields to explore and study. It's so fun and helpful to go back into the Internet Archives and find all of the graphics and websites and images of my earlier projects that I actually personally did not say. Thank the Internet Archive for helping me with my research, specifically in the topics of literature on cultural and social preservation because I'm from Pakistan. Most of the catalogs that we have from the British Indian era are locked away. I'm very grateful to this Internet Archive. Um, thank you. Wayback Machine is a tool we frequently use here at Neutral to look for deleted sites or online posts that were shared on social media. This allows us to have a proof to show who and what contributed to the spread of our misleading or false claim. Internet Archive is the reason this book exists. We use Wayback Machines to do a fake check on all of the work. The Internet Archive enabled our fact-checking team at Vera Files to find a record at the Senate of the Philippines website that our president now lied about graduating from the University of Oxford. Thanks to Internet Archive, as a writer and researcher, I can keep my texts, audios, and videos together. I use the Internet Archive to investigate human rights violations. For the past 23 years, the Internet Archive has made it possible for me to upload audio field recordings I've made at rainbow gatherings throughout the world. Thank you, Internet Archive, for enabling our fact-seeking work. Whenever we want to trace the digital footprints for any investigation, Wayback Machine is the most reliable tool. And I really couldn't write the Washington Post Fact Checker without uh, the Wayback Machine. Simply put, using the archive has always been and will continue to be great asset in the fact checking endeavor. Thank you, Internet Archive, for enabling research, early online culture. Thank you, Internet Archive. Thank you, Internet Archive. Thank you, Internet Archive. I'm very grateful for the Internet Archive for existing. Thank you.
Wow, it's so rewarding to see how people are making use of the archive to create and do great research. But how do we make sure that all of those patrons can easily discover and use the materials in the archive that they need? And how does AI help? Hello, everyone. I'm Drini Kami, and I'm excited to share with you some projects we've been working on that use AI to enable our librarians to, air, to make our materials more discoverable and easy to use at Internet Archive scale. In fact, AI and machine learning have been a core part of our digitization pipeline for a few years now. When a book is digitized, all we have is a bunch of photographs of pages. These photographs are great for humans who can easily make sense of them, but to make them searchable and discoverable, we need to make them make sense to a computer. First, we even have to tell it where the pages are, because these photos include things we don't want, like the scanning bed. Originally, scanner operators had to tediously and manually crop each of these images to correctly identify the page boundaries. In 2021, we trained a custom machine learning model on all of those manual page croppings from the years before to automatically suggest page boundaries to the scanner operators. This allowed them to double their rate of processing and made it possible for us to digitize even more books. Great, so now that we've found where the pages are, we want the computer to understand the words on these pages. For this, we use Tesseract, an open source machine learning based tool to convert the images into text a machine can easily understand. It's this process that makes it possible for our books to be searchable, accessible to those with print disabilities through features like Read Aloud, and available for bulk research, cross-referencing, and text analysis. Since beginning to use Tesseract in 2021, we've made over 14 million books, documents, microfiche, records, you name it, discoverable and accessible, and in over 100 languages. <laughs> but since last year, the definition of the term AI has shifted to mean something a little different. And as more capabilities like ChatGPT and large language models have been made available, we've been finding many new opportunities to allow our librarians to process more materials than ever, allowing us to tackle projects we previously couldn't in order to help improve discoverability and ease of use. A key part of material discoverability is good metadata. Remember, a digitized book is just a bunch of photographs. We need good metadata to know things like the title, author, history, subjects of the book, so that we can correctly connect patron searches to those books. And for some materials, even despite having the book text, metadata can be difficult to source, resulting in books that are a mystery to the computer. And this can be very difficult to find by searching for our patrons. To help tackle this problem, this year we've been piloting the Internet Archive Metadata Extractor, a tool that reads the, that book text that we talked about earlier from the front of the book and automatically extracts some key metadata elements. With this extra information, our librarians and metadata staff can match the digitized book to other full catalog records and solve these mystery books. And there are a lot of mystery materials in our catalog. We currently have over 300,000 of these mystery books, and that number continues to grow. We also used this tool in a project this year in partnership with the University of Toronto to digitize over 23,000 Canadian government documents. These documents were unlinked to catalog records and so also had no metadata. Labeling collections of this scale manually by hand was unfeasible but the new AI tooling allows librarians to make these previously unfeasible projects feasible. We've also been using AI to help make our materials easier to use for our patrons. For example, our Serials Metadata team, which works with digitized magazines and newspapers from the 20th century, has always worked to research and add descriptions to each of our periodicals. This is time consuming, taking an average of around 40 minutes to do that research and then write a description. 
and there are over 18,000 periodicals that need a description, so this is no small task. This year, the team began experimenting with using AI to help in the description writing process. Given metadata about a periodical, ChatGPT is asked to generate a description. Here, we use ChatGPT's prior knowledge about these periodicals, using it almost like a research assistant. This description is then vetted and edited by metadata staff, and finally uploaded back to the archive where it can help our patrons find the things they need. With AI assistance, writing descriptions has gone down from 40 minutes to just under 10 minutes. Another way we're using AI to improve patron and researcher experience is by extracting table of contents data from books. The diverse structure of table of contents across different books has made automated extraction difficult in the past. However, with AI, a new process has been developed, which initially identifies the table of contents using traditional programming, and then employs OCR and ChatGPT to extract the table in a structured format. This data can then be used in the book reader UI to help people navigate the book, and inside Open Library to help people discover the book. So that's a lot of projects. That's a lot of projects we've been able to make use of AI with. Because of AI, we've been able to create new tools to streamline the workflows of our librarians and metadata staff and make our materials easier to discover and work with for patrons and researchers. And those are just some of the many projects and experiments at the archive using AI right now. Other projects include everything from news summarization to the ability to talk to and ask questions of our materials, to AI-enabled search, or to citation parsing, or to you name it. And with new AI capabilities being announced and made available at a breakneck rate, new ideas and projects are constantly being added. I'd like to give a huge thank you to everyone who worked on these projects, gave me information, and kindly let me present all of their wonderful work on their behalves. Please now join me in, in welcoming another colleague of mine from the Internet Archive, Alexis Rossi, to talk about Woo! to talk about what kinds of research can be made possible when you aggregate these artifacts. Hello, everybody. <laughs> So the work Drini just described is helping us make sure every artifact in this library is well described and easy to find. That work makes it easier for researchers to find what they're looking for. And we've seen so many great projects using the resources in the Internet Archive. Helen Ende and Laura Gibbs use books from our library to study African folktales and share them with the public. Laura even wrote an entire book showing people all of the uh, tales that she found here in the Internet Archive. We see news stories come out pretty much every day that use the Wayback Machine as a resource. These are the outlets that used the Wayback Machine just this year for their reporting and fact-checking. Journalists like Philip Bump from the Washington Post, use aggregated data from our TV archive to report about the media bubbles that we all live in now. Libraries build collections to facilitate research. Sometimes we can anticipate the types of research that people will want to do. People have been using books one by one for thousands of years to learn. Other times, new uses emerge that we didn't anticipate. And AI is showing us what some of those uses might be. Let me tell you a story about why it's so important to have these large collections of digital materials. Probably everybody here has been surfing the web and you find a page in German, say, and Chrome pops up and says, hey, do you want that in English? You click yes, suddenly it's in English, and you can read it. That's the magic of machine translation. 
So how do you teach a computer to translate between languages? Essentially, you provide the computer with millions of sentence pairs, and the computer teaches itself. That's the artificial intelligence at work. A sentence pair is the same sentence represented in two different languages. It works like the Rosetta Stone. So the more sentence pairs you provide, the better the translation will be. For languages with lots of data, like German, French, and Spanish, the translations are pretty good. But when you have a language where there's less data available, less data equals worse translations. That means that a language with fewer speakers is less accessible online because our technology hasn't learned yet how to deal with it. So a few years ago, a group of European researchers from the University of Edinburgh and other universities and funded by the EU came to us asking for web content in European languages, including these underrepresented languages, so that they could try to make better translation models. Web pages like the ones stored in the Wayback Machine are a great data source for this. Sites in the same language, sorry, in different languages, they give you that Rosetta Stone situation, right? Same content, different languages. So we put together a set of data for them, and then the researchers went and did the hard part. They figured out which pages were translations of each other's, and then they matched up the sentences got rid of all of the data and filter, or all of the noise in the data and filtered it. And then they came out with open source data sets of these sentence pairs. Now for some languages this wasn't a big deal. German already has lots of stuff. It wasn't that big of an addition. But for other languages, the difference was huge. For instance, they more than doubled the number of sentences for Latvian and quadrupled the number of sentences for Romanian. Exactly. That allowed them to drastically improve the quality for these translations. Now this might seem kind of academic and like, cool, why do I care? <laughs> but um, this has come back around full circle to benefit the public. It turns out that the sentence pairs that came out in these open source data sets are now part of the underpinnings that allow Firefox to translate web pages for you, including in some of those underserved languages. Yeah. So this open source data is helping to level the playing field so that a nonprofit open source browser like Firefox can compete with a corporate behemoth like Chrome. That's amazing. That's amazing. And I, we are so happy that researchers can use these large data sets from libraries in ways that we never dreamed of. So what else might we be able to do with languages? According to Wikitongues, there are about 7,000 languages spoken today, 3,000 of which are endangered. And only 5% of languages are well represented online. Now, with stats like that, it is understandable that there are concerns that technology is leading to the demise of some of these smaller languages. But stories like the one I just told you show us that technology can also help us make these smaller languages more accessible online. Several years ago, we worked with nonprofit Panlex Project and the Culture Office of Bali to digitize all of the palm leaf manuscripts written in Balinese. Yeah. Balinese locals helped with the translation, and they also transcribed some of these. And if you want to know how underrepresented Balinese is online, we had to modify UTF-8 so that you could see all of the characters on your screen. But now we have these digital seeds for Balinese. Can we use them to increase online access for Balinese speakers? Exactly. <laughs> to do work like this, researchers and libraries must be able to collect large amounts of digital information 
and the researchers have to be able to access it. They need this data so that they and their machines can learn and help create tools that help us talk to each other. We live in a world with so much conflict. It's vital that we preserve languages, yes, but also the cultural artifacts. We need to keep them safe and accessible in our libraries. Yes. I will leave it to Quinn and Alyssa from the Stanford University to explain why. Everyone, please welcome them to the stage. There we go. <laughs> Hello, and thank you. My name is Quinn Nabrowski, and I am a digital humanities staff at Stanford, um, also teaching um, DLCL 103, Future Text, uh, AI and Literatures, Cultures, and Languages this quarter with Laura Whitman. Um, I'm, a form, I'm a former medieval Slavist, and also co-president of the US Professional Association for Digital Humanities. Immediately following Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, a group of volunteers from across North America and Western Europe came together to found uh, Saving Ukrainian Cultural Heritage Online, or SUCHO, which went on to archive over 50 terabytes of Ukrainian cultural heritage websites. The Internet Archive has been an essential partner in this work from the very beginning, scaling up their web archiving capacity in response to demand and developing new tools to allow volunteers to work faster and more efficiently. In summer 2022, Anna Rakitianskaya, a Sucho volunteer and a Slavic librarian at Harvard, proposed that Sucho capture memes from the war. Anna collaborated with my colleague Simon Wiles, a digital humanities developer at Stanford, to develop the Sucho Meme Wall, which shows off all the memes that our volunteers have collected, translated, and created rich annotations for by hand. We've had people approach us asking about whether AI could play a meaningful role in Sucho, and we've always said no, because we wanted this to be handled with extreme care and accuracy especially when it's a task that we know will be a meaningful way for people to come together and help when they would otherwise sit paralyzed, alone, and doom-scrolling the news. We shared our diverse expertise, technological, linguistic, cultural, and learned from one another, and then taught the next round of volunteers. We've still got a long way to go for machine inter interpretability of a lot of memes. So let's take this one as an example. It's my nine-year-old's favorite, and I imagine it'd be pretty easy for Dolly 3 to interpret. We start with Operation Z, which is the Russian name for their war, and in the second panel, Control Z. The Ukrainians have deleted the warship by sinking it. <laughs> what we got instead was the guess that the ship had reversed course, undone some previous action, when the ship itself had been undone especially in a world where so much AI training data is created under exploitative conditions, we made the choice to support and empower people who wanted to help preserve, protect, and showcase Ukrainian culture. And in doing so, we have created, to our knowledge, the largest set of real-world memes with this kind of extensive annotation about templates, people, events, as well as the transcription and translation of Ukrainian. If there's a future for AI-powered meme collection and annotation, it might start with this data set. But these means mean a lot more than just data. And for that, I will turn it over to my friend and colleague, Alyssa Verker. Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Alyssa Verker. I am a student at Stanford, and I'm currently teaching a Ukrainian language course. There is no relief during the war, uh, but there is always a way to feel closer and more connected to others. While so many Ukrainians have been separated from their families and loved ones, 
One of the most essential ways to connect throughout the war has been through memes. There has never been a war where we have had as much access to real-time coverage as we have during Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Today, thanks to Sucho and the Internet Archive, we have the ability to not only document Russia's war crimes, which is absolutely necessary, but to say vital elements of Ukrainian culture, perhaps none of which have been as vital for the survival and optimism of the Ukrainian spirit as memes. It is truly, <laughs> it's true, it is truly impossible to overemphasize the importance of Ukrainian memes for Ukrainian people in this war. Whether Ukrainians are hiding in bomb shelters right now in occupied territories or have fled as refugees, they are united with their community through the collective experience of memes. In the famous case of Chornobayevka, Ukrainians used memes to transform Russia's repeated attempt to take control of the Chornobayevka airport in Ukraine into a legendary and hilarious example of Russia's utter failure and incompetence. There is not a single Ukrainian that did not experience relief and laughter from Chornobayevka meme. Yes, this even includes my 91-year-old grandfather. Russians regularly bomb homes and hospitals, but they also make a concerted effort to bomb museums, schools, universities, and libraries in an attempt to fulfill their stated purpose of obliterating Ukrainian culture. By preserving memes that carry so much history and emotional connection, Sucho and the Internet Archive actively resist Russia's goal of the complete erasure of Ukrainian culture. When I look through the Sucho meme wall today, I remember each meme <laughs> as a cultural moment that helped me and millions of other Ukrainians gather strength and emerge from truly the darkest of places. As a Ukrainian American in the United States, these digital assets have given me tremendous insight, understanding, and empathy towards what those in Ukraine are going through today. Despite the most horrific of circumstances, in hiding, in occupied territories, and on the front lines, Ukrainians never give up their fight for their freedom, their culture, and human values. As is exemplified in the saying, be brave like Ukraine. I am humbled by the opportunity to tell you the story of so many Ukrainians today, and I am overwhelmed truly with gratitude for the Internet Archive's in invaluable role in ensuring our people will never be forgotten. Thank you. In the face of the struggles and injustices the Internet Archive is facing today, I want to remind us all to never give up and be brave like Ukraine. Slava Ukraini. Quinn, Alyssa, thank you so much so much for sharing this beautiful project. These digital meme collections are not just a source of connection for those alive today, but are precious historical artifacts, like World War II posters or letters from the Civil War. Those in the future will be able to comprehend more about this moment in time thanks to them. But there is still so much we have to understand about the world today. Here to talk about a decade's worth of work turning the Internet Archive into a research platform, please welcome the founder of the GDELT project. Everyone, please welcome him to the stage. Thank you so much. It's truly an honor to be here tonight. Click. There we go. It's truly an honor to be here tonight. So what is the Internet Archive? 
To most of you, you probably think about the web and the book archive. To me, what I'm so fascinated by is a television news archive. A hundred channels from 50 countries on five continents in 35 languages over portions of the last 20 years. One of the most incredible archives of visual storytelling of global events. Now, about a decade ago, the founder of the TV News Archive, Roger McDonald, reached out and said, how can journalists and scholars use this incredible archive to tell the stories of the world, to understand when we turn on the news, what are we hearing about and how is it framed? So one of our very first collaborations was to map the geography of television. In other words, when I turn on the television, where am I hearing about? And we actually made this incredible map. It was like raindrops on a map every time a location was, was mentioned. Now, this in turn led to something called the TV Explorer. So this idea of taking closed captioning, allowing you to keyword search that. So journalists, for example, could ask, how much attention is COVID getting right now? How much attention is inflation getting? Um, all the major events, Ukraine, you know, all these different events across the world, how much attention are they getting? How are they being framed? And in turn, you think about on television, it's not just a spoken word, it's the on-screen text that goes with it. So in the same way that books, you, know, you take a photograph of a book page and you use technology to turn that into text. We did the same with television, to extract all that on-screen text. And one of the earliest examples that we did was we took Donald Trump's tweets and we scanned for them across television news and showed how he was able to drive the cable news agenda um, from his tweets. Now, in turn, this, 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 uh, this, back this question of the connection between television and the online world. So one of the things we've done is, so here's a clip, this is CNN during COVID, and it just said, from Russia somewhere. But where? What's the story behind this clip? So we showed how you can take a clip from television and scan the open web for that. Uh, and this text you see beneath was actually the description of the video when it first appeared in the web. So being able to connect across modalities. Uh, and also fact check them. So this is a fascinating example. We took a, a known fact check, so an existing fact check, and we used um, new AI tools to scan television news for any reference related to that. And this is really powerful as fact checkers to be able to say, where's this narrative gaining traction? Uh, so last year, when Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, so Mark Graham at the, um, at the Internet Archive championed this idea of how do we preserve, you know, this is a huge moment. How do we preserve Russian, Belarusian, and Ukrainian television? And that led to this incredible archive of what were the narratives? How was, this, you know, how was each country telling the story at this moment? Um, and so then, so the archive then came to me and said, well, how do we make this accessible to journalists and scholars? We have this incredible, incredible archive. How do we make this accessible? So the first thing that we did was create something called the Visual Explorer. So we took each broadcast, and every four seconds, we extract one image, and we make a thumbnail grid. And so this is a broadcast. So you think about television, it's linear, you know, it just plays, plays, plays. Well, by making it something like this, you can skim television now. So if I want to know, did, did Vladimir Putin appear anywhere in this broadcast? Um, how much military imagery was shown? How often is, was the Z shown at this point? This is early on in, uh, in Russian television. Um, I can do that. Um, I can scan all of this very rapidly as a human being. So remember also, sometimes the most powerful AI is AI that allows us, that amplifies us as a human being to be able to use our ability to understand and kind of gets rid of a lot of that, that grunt work. Now, of course, a lot of television across the world is not closed captioned. So starting early on, we applied Google speech to tech technology to transcribe these in the Russian and then use Google Translate to translate these in English. Now again, that's far from perfect, but it allows, thank you, thank you. Um, it allows us now, journalists can go through this and say, well, what are they saying? How are they spinning these narratives? What are they paying attention to? And that's incredibly, incredibly powerful. And fast forward to today, we're using a new tool. So this is something, Google has something called Chirp. Uh, it's, a, it's a large speech model. It's essentially um, sort of the new era of speech recognition. Recognizes over 100 languages, but what's most interesting about this and this whole generation of new tools, multilingual. So this is an actual broadcast. This is a Chinese state television. Uh, three languages in 60 seconds. We've got English, Mandarin, Arabic in 60 seconds in this, in this particular clip. All transcribed right there. This is incredibly powerful. For the first time, we can start studying how do multilingual societies tell their stories. Um, you, you, it's really, really incredible what we can actually, the questions we can ask now. 
But of course, what makes television news so powerful is the visual dimension. If you took all of that television and you start looking at it like this, you start looking at all the stories across the world. But look at this, all the visual stories. So how can a machine help us make sense of the visual dimension of all of this? So we've been exploring how a variety of different AI tools can help us understand visual storytelling. Not, the tr not just the spoken word, not just the on-screen text, but the imagery, the visual metaphors. So one early question was to say, what if we took Russian television for a year and folded it on itself, compared every second to every other second? So we can actually trace clips and see how those clips are being reused. But more interestingly, visual metaphors, so things that are not the same, but have similar color schemes, similar, similar visual styles. And it turns out some really fascinating things you can do with visual metaphors. Now, facial recognition is a very scary area. So the way we've been approaching it is for major public figures, handing it a picture and saying, find others that look like this. So in this case, Tucker Carlson, we knew that he appeared a lot on Russian television, but how much? So we literally took his picture, and we were able to track his appearances across Russian television. This is really powerful, and document just how important he was to telling their narratives. But then we took an episode of 60 Minutes, that's a, a famous Russian show, and what we did is we extracted out every face that appeared on there, and who occur, co-occurs with whom. Now this is really powerful, who is telling the story? So we can see complex here, but we can see Olga here at the center. She's, she's kind of the, the star of the show there. We can see her at the center there. Now, we scaled this up to an entire year of that show, and we can see all these complex dynamics that are at the center, her. Now this is really powerful that we can take these tools. So when you think about it, it's just like, well, who's in this, this page? Or sorry, this, uh, this image. What we're more interested in is questions like this. How can we use this to understand visual storytelling? Now, computer vision historically was predefined categories, about 30,000 objects and activities that machines can understand. So in the early days of COVID, we said, what's different about COVID uh, television coverage compared to pre-COVID? The answer, books everywhere. <laughs> but not on every channel. And this was really interesting to us. Now, this is really powerful, and we use this on Russian television to show military imagery in the early days of the war, and then as Russia realized it was losing, less and less and less coverage. And then they felt that they were gaining some ground, so then they start ramping up again. So this is a really powerful way of kind of understanding, like, how are governments portraying? Like, what, in this particular case, how does Russia feel about how it's doing on the battlefield? And this is really, really powerful, but still, it's a predefined category. I'm limited to what someone else came up with. So there are tools today, we have a demo of this. Type in an English language description, like soldier in front of a flag, and it will find imagery that matches that. But, here comes the really cool part. What about the inverse? So we have a golden retriever detector. So this is part of the, part of the AI Explorer. It actually scans for golden retrievers on, t on television news. So here's an example of one. And we asked the machine, describe this image. Everything you see there was written by a machine. This is where we're at today. Um, this is really, really powerful, the ability to have a machine watch television and tell us about it. But there are a lot of limitations. What you're hearing mostly about generative AI today is the height, the pauses. There's a lot of limits. So hallucination, you may have heard that term before. So we handed a broadcast about the Chinese spy balloon and, it's, and asked it to summarize it. And it became a nuclear-capable hypersonic missile aimed at the American homeland. <laughs> Not quite what you want for television summary. Uh, false transcripts, it said NATO fully pr praises Putin and says he was a, did a great job. Um, it's plagiarized summarize. So sometimes you say summarize this, and it goes out and it finds clips from across the web of people saying similar things and glues those together. Now, bias is a really scary thing. So for about 60, 70 years now, we've had keyword search. So if you have a collection of biographies and you type in CEO, you're going to get the biographies that mention the word CEO the most. But nowadays, semantic search, if you run the same query with a semantic search engine, white men first, minority men second, women last. This is a huge issue that people are not really, everyone's kind of rushing to the space without realizing. If you ask them to make a summary, to resummarize that, it's even worse. So these are really big issues to think about. Um, distraction. Summarize this Russian broadcast in English, midway through it sees a reference to Rome, gets distracted, and starts summarizing in Italian. <laughs> And then this is a really scary thing. Machines are not really good at understanding. What country has supported Ukraine the most? Russia, because it's delivered the most weapons. These are, you know, these are really scary things that these machines can do. Um, but there's still a lot of powerful things that we can do. We can take a day of COVID coverage and say, make a narrative map of everything that's being said and how it's interconnected. We can have a machine watch an entire day of Russian television and summarize it. Moment, everything here was mud by a machine. Summarize it moment by moment. Uh, but of course, why summarize? Well, because you want to do something with it. So we had it watch a day of Iranian television, 
and said, find every reference to the nuclear accord and any criticism, write a uh, point by point rebuttal. Digital diplomacy, automated diplomacy. Now, again, is this a wonderful, the future of diplomacy and an amazing thing? Or is this a really frightening future um, that has a lot of danger for society? Um, these are really fascinating questions. Either way, this future is here, but it's our shared future. It's up to us to decide, you know, because again, hallucination, all the limitations that goes with this and all the impact on society. Do we really want machines to be writing all this stuff for us? These are huge questions. Um, and finally, I want to give a huge shout out to Tracy Jayquist. So she's the architect of the TV News Archive. Um, I can't see where she is, but uh, give her a huge shout out. So she created a really neat tool recently. It takes the on-screen text and then summarize it. You can go to archive.org, the television news archive section of it. Go there today and you'll actually see this. And it's using this on-screen text and doing a live summary of what's being said on television each day. Again, the incredible power of making this content more accessible. And thank you so much. Hopefully this has been an inspiration to you um, of what's possible today. Thank you so much. All right, well, speaking of narrative maps and big questions, hi, everyone. My name is Jamie from the Internet Archive. And by show of hands, uh, who here is just crazy excited about AI? Okay, okay. Uh, is anyone kind of uneasy about AI? Not sure where it's going to take us? Okay, a lot of people, yeah. Okay, um, is anyone upset or angry or really afraid by show of hands of AI, democratizing catastrophe weapons, super intelligence, that sort of thing? Okay, there's a few of you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, now all of you have your own reasons for why you believe things differently. You have your own experiences and your own insights that inform your point of view. So at the Internet Archive, we've been pretty sincere about trying to understand what are people's different views and why they disagree, so that we can inform how we as an organization can serve both the public and our mission in this time of intense technological change. So we started a series of hackathons and invited people from different groups who hold different views to come and debate, do research, and have conversations. We invited people from alignment researchers to those who want to accelerate AI. And we asked them to do research and answer questions like, well, what do you actually mean when you're using the term AI? And what kind of risk do you perceive with AI? We also borrowed some deeply wicked ethical questions that were posed by OpenAI this summer, like, should AI ever be used to instill beliefs in people? We came up with over 800 topics of debate about artificial intelligence, just as a start. But things are changing so fast, and these debates are ongoing, and so I really don't think there's any way we can just organize enough hackathons to sort out 800 AI debates. If you are relying on human beings to do the research and the debating. So, to understand the debates that are happening in AI, we turned to AI itself to help us research topics and map debates. So instead of collecting arguments from people showing up at a physical place at a specific time, one of our hackathoners, and this is a story of AI working out really well, uh, one of our hackathoners created an autonomous research agent to crawl through the web and identify claims related to topics on our list. When it identifies a claim that's relevant to us, it summarizes and extracts it. We also created a prompt-based model that extracts arguments, claims, and evidence from entire artifacts, like open access scholarly journal, journal articles and websites, and then it filters out all of the irrelevant claims. A secondary model interprets the correctness of those extractions, because of course you gotta look out for the hallucinations. But in the past day alone, we extracted over 23,000 claims from 500 references for about $15. And this rate is approximately 12,000 claims per hour with just one machine running. I actually have a background in this kind of analysis work, doing it by hand. And the fastest I've ever seen a human being do this is 300, under 300 claims per hour. We also built a prompt injector, which creates a sequence of prompts with a few shot examples to identify positions that people take on questions about AI to give us a sort of top-level scaffolding of the debate. Then using this tool, we generate arguments across economic, oop, no, going back. All right, uh, across e ethical, environmental, economic, and nine other categories, which su support or refute those positions. So let's dive into just one example. Question, should we regulate AI? 
To find the high-level general positions people take, we used our prompt injector that was tuned with those few shot examples to pull data from ChatGPT to give us the high-level positions. So this was machine generated. One position, we should allow technology companies the freedom to develop AI technologies as they see fit with minimal government interference. Another one, we should impose strict laws on the development and deployment of AI technologies to ensure safety. Here's another position. Heavy regulation is unnecessary as the AI industry is mostly self-regulating, capable of learning from its mistakes and improving. I chose those ones. There's a, there's a whole bunch of positions that it chose. <laughs> okay. The prompt injector uh, then prompts GPT-4 to identify likely arguments within the 12 different categories and any additional ones which we may want to add. Uh, for example, an economic argument in favor of regulating AI may include Regulating AI has economic benefits as it prevents unchecked development that could lead to financial harm. High risk, low probability threats such as unchecked AI magnify financial risk by increasing the likelihood of rare but costly disasters. These disasters can potentially cascade globally, massively impacting the concentrated tech sectors and therefore disrupting fragile global economies. That was created by AI. An argument against the regulation of AI, there is a concern that government regulation could lead to a convergence of AI technologies towards a one-size-fits-all standard, stifling diversity and reducing the potential benefits of competition and variety in the market. So now we have this framework of the debate, these high-level positions corresponding to these questions, which we can actually start modeling in a graph. From there, we can take the claims and evidence that we've extracted from the bottom up and start connecting them with the top-down positions that we had generated. It's a sort of connection of the scaffolding. We're still working on integrating the logical coherence middle part, <laughs> which is actually a lot of work. But already, these maps as is are incredibly comprehensive. The map that I showed you earlier actually has over 540 of those arguments. But um, who wants to look at a map besides me? So, we decided that we were going to create a tool to make it easier to see. We created a tool that summarizes these claims and uh, visualizes them as an interactive, unpackable piece of paper. So what does this mean? This means instead of you spending potentially hundreds of hours researching the different points of view about AI, you can instead read a paper which shows you arguments from different points of view, and we can actually automate this paper over time as we continuously process more information. So. AI can help us research and understand what we think about AI, the pros, the cons of the technology, not by limiting the conversation to just those people who can show up and be in a room, but instead by combining the collective points of view from people across the web and across the world by creating new infrastructure that could accommodate it. Our goal is to automate the creation of these maps with these various tools that we've built, and then link evidence to claims that, we've, um, that we will do through techniques like retrieval augmented generation. Then, of course, give this information for free away as a library. Um, having built, <laughs> like I said before, having built these deliberation graphs by hand for years, um, I can tell you very definitively that putting together these materials with automation is going to save thousands of research hours for any one reader. And for this project, we still have, again, hundreds of debates. Hundreds of debates. <laughs> hundreds of debates and much more work to do since much of the progress was made like literally in the past couple of weeks or days. But if you want to get involved or maybe you want to join a future hackathon or you want to play with these toys, just go ahead and send me an email and of course look for more information and forthcoming blog posts. And really, uh, that is all my time, friends. So I just want to thank the Society Library, first and foremost, for lending us the methods, the tools, and the training data to make this possible, as well as OpenAI for their tools as well. And then, yes, everybody, I want to thank our hackathoners who showed up over the summer and built so many of these tools. They actually built, yeah. They actually built so many more tools than I could possibly talk about tonight on stage. And if you're in the audience, I just want to let you know I really appreciate all the work that you did. Thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. All right, well, next up, please welcome my colleague, Alison Dutman, to the stage. She is the president of the Foresight Institute, which is an organization working to advance research and frontier science and technology. Everyone, Alison.
right. Uh, now, here we go. OK, wonderful. Well, thanks, uh, Jamie. I think we've heard from so many wonderful projects already that uh, really speak to all the ways in which the Internet Archive is using AI already. I'm here to tell you about something totally different, which is how the Internet Archive as a physical location um, and as a community and as an ecosystem is really facilitating conversations about the long-term future of AI and about crucial topics in AI. And so please bear with me as I'm going to uh, kind of like very briefly walk through a few of these really wonderful examples. So I'm Alison. I'm, I run Foresight Institute, which is a nonprofit in the Bay Area. 37 years old, so um, exists since long, long before my time, I guess a few years before my time. Uh, but we're really focusing on advancing technology for the long-term benefit of life. And so we don't just focus on AI, even though we call it intelligent cooperation, what you see uh, in the corner here, but we also focus on molecular nanotechnology, longevity biotech, space, neurotechnology, and we all have it under the wrapper of existential hope. So we want distinctively positive futures from these technologies. Now, when I say that we support these technologies, I mean that we give out prizes, we give out grants, we give out fellowships throughout the year, but what we really like to do is hosting, and that's where the Internet Archive comes in very, very handy. And so you guys have hosted now over four years of our Vision Weekend, so usually when I stand up here, I'm hosting one of our uh, big end-of-year festivals, which is Vision Weekend, and so thank you so, so much for being the container in which we're able to bring our community together, and many of you uh, have also joined these events, and I know that there's a ton of overlap, and I really want to thank you guys. I think without you, like, these events really wouldn't have been possible and without you really we wouldn't have such a really wonderful community at the end of the day with so much overlap um, as well but I think what's really really interesting is more of the kind of technical events this one is one that I found um, it's a little bit I guess um, uh, intermingled here but I remember when Brewster I heard you say and overheard you in a conversation about that there's so many parallels between the corporations that we have um, uh, and between the potential AIs that we're building because we need to align corporations and potential institutions with human values, uh, and we also want to align AIs with human values. And not only Brewster said that, but someone in Foresight's community said that, then a legal scholar said it, and eventually we're like, why don't we just do an event where we try to um, kind of like bring people, different legal scholars, different technical AI alignment researchers, different people working in institutions together and figure out if there are specific parallels between the way that we treat institutions and organizations and the way that we should align uh, AI systems with human values. Because at the end of the day, uh, um, corporations or institutions could already be um, kind of like seen as super intelligence that already exists and the idea is really like how do we align them uh, better with human values so that was one of the events that we hosted here and that was now five years ago and I think that this kind of like thinking is really sifting through into many people's minds now so I really thank the Internet Archive for being a space in which you can talk about these more out there ideas uh, really early on uh, that I think often make it into a uh, public imagination um, uh, really after a few years Next one up, we've had uh, an event this year here, the Cryptography Security AI Workshop, uh, and that was really kind of focusing on bringing together another type of community, working in cryptography, security, and AI. Again, these are three communities that I think should be talking much more with each other, but aren't always talking very much with each other. And I think what was really interesting here is that you had a lot of people really from the Internet Archive communities and like adjacent communities coming and really trying to figure out what kind of tools can we uh, be building that would help decentralize AI, that would help make AI safe, that would hel help make AI secure and ultimately human aligned tools like anti-collusion, uh, tools like uh, different new technologies that would help us use uh, local data, that would help us uh, really kind of like we really, um, leverage local information that we could otherwise not leverage using these more centralized tools. So thank you so, so much, everyone, who joined that workshop. It was a ton of fun. And again, I think it was one of these cutting edge conversations that I can't really see myself hosting anywhere else and at the Internet Archive. Last but not least, um, there was DWeb Camp. Who was at DWeb this year? OK. Um, well, if you haven't been there yet, uh, I really, really, really recommend you go next year. It's one of my favorite events, um, really, uh, throughout the year. Uh, it is hosted by the Internet Archive, and it is a really wonderful community that comes together in a beautiful location uh, and that thinks about various topics about the decentralized web. And um, we hosted a, uh, an open AI think tank that was really like trying to focus on the intersection between decentralized technologies that DWeb is building and AI at large. And we had a ton of different, um, very controversial sometimes, uh, talks uh, and discussions there, focusing on open source versus closed, on how you basically compensate artists and other data providers um, and, and really other kind of like con contributors uh, to the AI ecosystem accurately in the new age of AI. It was pretty wild and it was really, really wonderful. So thank you so, so much for allowing us um, 
I really like to kind of lean into these amazing questions there. Now, if you want to hear more of any of this, we are going to be hosting again Vision Weekend here. And one thing that I wanted to mention is that, yes, we also have a kind of tech tree tool, but I'm only bringing this up here because it was actually launched at uh, an Internet Archive event at a Vision Weekend here uh, a few years ago. And so I think really I want to thank you from the bottom of Foresight's heart to thank you to the Internet Archive for being the kind of container and space and ecosystem that allows many of these conversations to happen where I couldn't see any other place uh, holding them down. So thank you so, so much for hosting and for becoming this like library that really welcomes so many people into its fold. Um, all right. Without, without further ado, I want to introduce Peter Wang. Peter Wang, as uh, I think, um, well, m most people here, I guess, really know him. Uh, so he really deserves, uh, or like needs no further introduction. But uh, Peter has been working uh, really over 15 years now, um, uh, m building many of the tools that many of you guys are using, uh, and is currently the CEO of Anaconda. Um, and Peter, I actually also met at a D-Web five years ago, I think, right, was it, Peter? So thank you so much for all the work that you do. I'm really excited to welcome you up on stage. Come on up here, Peter, the stage is yours. Is it on? Oh, there it is, okay, great, fantastic. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, and uh, thank you to the archive for the great honor of inviting me here. This is an incredible room. I gotta take a picture to brag to my son and my daughter, if you don't mind. There you go, woo! Oh wow, there's a bright spotlight, yeah. Make some noise, woo! All right, so um, as Allison mentioned, I am, uh, I am the CEO and the founder of Anaconda. I also created the PyData community and organized a bunch of open source nerds into pushing Python as a good language for data and, and, and uh, data science and ML. And uh, that was about 10 or 11 years ago. Back then it was a scripting language. It was just an alternative to Ruby maybe. And now it is of course the language of AI, for better or worse. Um, but, um, but the interesting thing as, as someone who kind of, you know, has been in open source for a while, but certainly over the last 10 or 11 years as a community organizer, something that, that started dawning on me is that for all the talk of intellectual property and copyrights, and of course all of the, 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 the troubles that are being brought to the archive um, from, from the uh, position of intellectual property, the interesting thing about open source software is that it is a very strong demonstrator of the kind of value that can be created when we don't take knowledge and information and put it in the box of property. Um, and it's not just, you know, Thomas Jefferson, a contemporary of, of Benjamin Franklin's, Thomas Jefferson had that great quote about how when I light someone else's candle with mine, it doesn't diminish my flame. So it's sort of saying knowledge is not rivalrous, but I would argue that when you have the ability for people to collaborate without these kinds of boundaries, you actually have something that's anti-rivalrous, that the more you give away of this thing, the more valuable it becomes. And there's nothing physical in the world that is like that. If I give you an apple, you, I don't get more apples, right? Um, if I build a beautiful house on a spot of land in front of a waterfall, there's not 10,000 more waterfalls available. But with information and knowledge and open source software, if I make a project and I share it with someone else, they're more likely to find a bug. They might improve the documentation a little bit. They might adapt it for a no novel use case that I can then benefit from. Sharing increases value. And so when we just let this run unfettered, we see what an anti-rivalrous and abundant and regenerative approach to knowledge sharing can be. And the, more, the really interesting thing that comes from this is that it's not even about the software. What's interesting is the kinds of people and the kinds of communities and the kinds of human ecologies that emerge around these cultures of sharing. It's really very different than traditional top-down, hierarchical, scarcity, zero-sum, finite game kinds of arrangements of the human condition. And for me, as a physicist who is not a humanities major, watching these things happen in the space of code and software collaboration was really, really super interesting. And, and this is the reason I talk about this is because, well, let's start with the question, what is the Internet Archive, right? Is it a building? It's a fantastic building, right? Is it a pile of servers? It's a bunch of really, really important servers. But more than that, I would say, and, and, and obviously kudos to the Archive, to Brewster, to, to, to everyone who works so hard on this project, on everything you've done here, but I would say the thing you should also give yourself kudos for is the community of people that you've built around this project. Uh, clay ones and real ones. And the, 
the thing about this is that I have gone to D-Web events. Um, I read about the first um, decentralized web conference summit that was held here with a massive FOMO. And I was like, the next time they do one of these things, I got to go there. And I went there. And every single person I met was both a technologist and a humanist. Every single person I met understood the importance of knowledge to the future of humanity and human thriving. And that, to pull this group of people together, is actually one of the most important things that the archive does, I would say. And congratulations to all of the people. Congratulations and thank you, Brewster, for doing this. And this is important because, well, I'll tell you why. I'll quote a, I'll quote a Nobel laureate, uh, uh, Ilya Prigozhin, who um, famously said that in, uh, when, when a complex system is far from equilibrium, small islands of coherence have the ability to shift the entire system to a higher order. And I would like to think that we're small islands of coherence, maybe trying to get more coherent, but it has to start somewhere, right? And, and hopefully, um, well, I mean, I, I believe, maybe some people agree, that right now the world system is somewhat far from equilibrium, for better or worse. Um, and, and this is just my, my two cents, but I, I do believe that some kind of transhuman intelligence is possible. I believe that we will get to a point where, um, where we will have something that is not like human intelligence, that can do things that we can't do. We, some might say we already have that. Um, certainly can beat all of us at Go and chess, right? And compute all these like protein folding things. It can automatically translate all these languages. Any of those things 20 years ago would have been amazing. Now we're like, well, is it really smart? Well, I think it's pretty darn smart, right? But here's the interesting thing. I think even things that are smarter than us, I think we have the ability to affect uh, its values. So the question for us then, for me at least, is not can and will transhuman intelligence emerge. It's when it does, how do we imbue it with values, with our values, with values that are good values? Um, and yes, that's a values question. That's a value judgment. Um, and, and it might seem, I, I know that you know, Jamie was presenting some of the different arguments about can or cannot, can it not be governed or whatever. The thing is, every single one of you here, I believe, is a human being. And I also believe you're probably smarter than any of the billions of cells that comprise your body. But you're not distinct from the cells in your body, you are of those cells. And I think that any transhuman intelligence that we build, that's built by humans or machines built by humans, will intrinsically be infused with the values of the people that build it. It will be of the, those people, it will be of that culture. Which is why it's important for a small coherent group of people to create a culture that creates these kinds of things with good values. And if we don't do that intentionally, then the status quo will continue. And what is the status quo? The status quo is a society, a world order, driven fundamentally by a point of view of sort of industrial capitalist, efficiency optimizing, scarcity mindset kinds of dynamics. And we will literally burn up the world and kill everyone because we just didn't come up with any better. So this total phenomenon concept is something that is what's creating so much angst and so much bad things in the world, not because any individual, maybe there's a few individuals that I've mentioned here <laughs> that really add more to it than others, but in general, the world system is a totalizing phenomenon around efficiency optim optimization. If we just do that, we might all turn into paper clips, okay? Um, and, and the reason why it's important for the humanist technologists, like the people here in this room, to be aware of this dynamic is because what I've seen in the adoption of open source, of course, the open source software on Python that's kind of my, 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 my um, uh, home community, Watching it get adopted, watching it turned into a part of the machinery of the world, it's very obvious to me that just because you build the golems, just because your bits comprise Moloch, doesn't mean you get a seat at the table and where Moloch goes and how to govern it at all. And so if you look around at the world today, we have created these incredible towering stacks of technological com complexity, and those of us who are good at it, of course, we're part of the higher order of the technological caste system, and there's many people who are at the lower orders of it, and that's just the way it is. And even if you start with something very open, and something very good, and something regenerative, and an infinite game, and all these things, it will naturally fall into this kind of dynamic. And if you look at open source software, initially with a sharing culture and everything, and now so many pieces of open source software you know, just start basically as a free loss leader to get people sucked into some proprietary cloud API paywall thing. And if you look at the web, how the web started, it was everyone could set up an HTML page and everyone could talk to each other and all these wonderful things, and it becomes a monetization funnel for eyeballs and attention economy, right? So we cannot pretend that technology can remain value neutral. It will propagate, perpetuate 
the values of the existing system unless we're intentional to, d to uh, drive it a different direction. And so with this, of course, it's easy to understand why people feel AI doom, right? Why people feel like, oh, you know what? This is really dangerous. These things could really screw up the world, um, and we need government to come in and, and step in and take a heavy-handed action on this stuff. And I'm not going to the details of, of yes or no. I think governments do have a role to play. But I would say that, you know, um, what I've seen is that the important thing about the, the really important thing about AI technology is that it is ultimately a knowledge technology. It is about knowledge, sense making, information, and people getting smarter and understanding the world better. And one of the most compelling uses of knowledge historically has been to create political movements that challenge the status quo. So if you entrust only government actors and state actors and people in, in situations of power to govern what knowledge infrastructure can do, that may not be the best arrangement of affairs, right? And, and even more so than this, on kind of very prosaic matter, if you look at the world today, the internet, the technology world we have today, so much of what has made technological process po uh, progress possible has been open standards and protocols. And those emerge, um, those emerge not only, they, they, they not only increase compatibility moving forward, they also lock innovation open. And that emerges in a marketplace of ideas. And the problem is, if you shut it all down and you close it up and you say, here's a cartel, here's a government regulation, here's these other things, we lock all these things down, then what ends up happening is that, uh, what, what I believe will end up happening, is that closeness will intrinsically turn marketplaces of ideas into battlefields. And it will completely destroy, remove all the oxygen from allowing auditability and openness and actual transparent governance to emerge. So this is just my personal belief around this, but I think this is really based on everything I've seen in open source, based on everything I've seen about the intersection of technology and human values. Um, transparency at least creates a level playing field for the good guys to have a chance. Because if we don't do something, if we don't have a chance, what will end up happening is the, the, essentially the existing powers that be, the status quo, will just build more moats. They will just keep building more moats because that's the way you extract value not by just giving everything away for free. That happens way out in some like Burning Man camp out in the desert, but in the city, we lock everything down and we suck rents out of everything, and that's what's gonna happen with this. Unless we can start now and say, what are the values that the infinite game people uh, can establish for an AI era, right? To, to borrow one of Brewster's sayings, how do we lock innovation open moving forward? Um, and my answer to this builds upon a really brilliant articulation from John Perry Barlow of the Electro Electronic Frontiers Foundation, and he wrote 20 years ago, I think it was, that information is a verb, right? If we think about information, we t tend to use information and knowledge interchangeably as words, as nouns, but actually information is a verb. The act of sense-making, the act of understanding is an act. It's an experience, it's not possessed. It's the dance, not the dancer. And the interesting thing about the dance and the dancer metaphor, if we can extend that a little bit, is that with AI technology, with LLMs, humans are not the only dancers anymore. <laughs> We're gonna have to start dancing with robots. And it could be wonderful, it could be terrifying, but this is the world that's coming, and to extend the metaphor even further, what is the stage? That stage, that substrate, is human knowledge, human experience. It's the technologies that we use to communicate with each other. It's all of that. And I think today there was just a wonderful, through all these amazing talks uh, from the previous speakers, you know, you could see from, the, from, from libraries evolving from being a repository, free access to knowledge. You go there and you can read books and you can learn English. I learned English by reading books from the Middletown, Connecticut library uh, and not from the Chinatown one here in San Francisco, but it's a very similar story. Um, and so libraries start as a repository of knowledge and then many of the research projects that were shown they demonstrate how the Internet Archive as a digital library is a substrate for research, such an important and critical substrate. But I think, the, for me, the mission of the Archive to provide universal access to all knowledge, in a forward-looking sense, in an AI era, it becomes even more important because it's no longer just a repository, it's no longer just even the substrate, but it's actually a bastion for sovereign sense-making for humans. It is actually something critical that we need, because if we don't start with the foundation there, we cannot have anything else to build upon. 
So a commons approach to knowledge is absolutely key to preserving human agency in an era of transhuman intelligence, and it gives us a place to start from to then infuse those things with the values we care about, diversity, right, inclusion, and many different kinds of perspectives, and truth, and all these kinds of things. We don't stand a chance if we don't at least start with something that is that bastion and that starting point. So thank you to the archive for having me here. Thank you all for coming. And um, thank you to the archive for doing the wonderful work. Please, all of you, contribute, support the important mission. I, I wholly believe this with all my heart, and I, I would like to encourage all of you to, to support the archive and its important mission. Thank you so much. Thanks, Peter. It's good. Can we just give all these speakers a hand of applause, please? Before we depart for the evening, I just really wanted to say thank you to everyone for showing up and for all of you virtually, thank you. Um, we appreciate all of, the, all of you who came out tonight. What's great about the work I do leading philanthropies, I get to work with an extraordinary team, a philanthropy team, and we tell the stories. All this great work and research you heard tonight, we get to tell the stories that impact our mission every day. Because all the great tools and all the initiatives and projects that you heard tonight were supported by your generosity. As the director of philanthropy, um, uh, I get to basically work with, I get the privilege of working with thousands of contributors all over the world who depend on the Internet Archive. And they depend on it because of all the research and the fact checking and the variety of use cases that you all heard tonight. Plus millions of you get to access our collections, our books, TV archives, mu movies, music, the Wayback Machine, and so much more. This is all made possible through public and private contributions. Providing universal access is no easy task. We can't do it alone. So if you've enjoyed and if you use the Internet Archive and you see all this incredible value, I'm going to ask you tonight to look at your donor advised fund or foundation to go online and make a donation at archive.org or you can make a donation via this QR code. Because we are one community tied together by the internet, this connected web of knowledge sharing. And we have a commitment to an inclusive and open internet where there are many winners and where ethical approaches to generative AI and research are supported. We appreciate your unwavering support of our digital library, especially in these precarious times. And as I close, I'd only ask that you not forget that the real solution lies in our deep human connection. It inspires the most amazing acts of generosity and humanity. Thank you. All right, my friends, that's a wrap. Thank you for being here and for supporting the Internet Archive. And thanks to all the artists who created me and all the open source and free technology that contributed to my being. Please now enjoy the party outside, including music from the band Hot Buttered Rum. I'll see you in the future. <laughs>